while the term chord scale theory can denote a number of different approaches, I'm using the term here to signify music theory that's derived from George Russell's concept of chord scale unity. Russell describes chord scale unity in his book, The Lydian Chromatic Concept. It's easy to dismiss Russell's work as an eccentric attempt to supplant traditional harmonic theory. I think this is because Russell uses a myriad of technical terms that seem eccentric. For example, what is a tonal station? What is horizontal tonal gravity? What is a primary modal genre? I personally believe that Russell's theory has a lot to offer once you get past the idiosyncratic terminology. I will show how I use Russell's theory in my own work as a composer and as a music theorist. I will attempt, wherever possible, to substitute conventional terms for Russell's idiosyncratic ones. To me, the most confusing thing about Russell's terminology is that he relates all of the diatonic modes to Lydian. He has a very good reason for doing this, but it does make things very confusing. I suggest using conventional terms for the modes. For example, Russell's Lydian mode 2 is Mixolydian. Russell's mode 6 is simply Dorian. Russell's non-diatonic modes have conventional names as well. The Lydian augmented mode is melodic minor ascending. The Lydian diminished mode is harmonic major. The Lydian flat 7 mode is Lydian dominant, or in a slightly different form, melodic minor. The auxiliary augmented scale is whole tone. The auxiliary diminished and the auxiliary diminished blues scales are both octatonic. It is true that many of these do not sound like their conventional equivalents. For example, the Lydian flat 7 scale doesn't really sound like melodic minor. That's because it's a Lydian version of melodic minor. In other words, if you take a melodic minor scale and start on the fourth scale degree, you get a Lydian flat 7 scale. Since you can build scales on any of the scale degrees of these modes, they all have seven relative modes. So it makes no difference to me which one you choose as a reference. Why not choose a conventional one? While it originated in jazz, chord scale theory can be applied to any style of music. In his book, Russell analyzes the first prelude from Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier. This is problematic because it contains exclusively arpeggiated chords. This makes it very difficult to show that Bach intended to match certain scales with certain chords. Mozart's Sonata K545 includes passages that contain nothing but scales matched with chords. Analyzing those passages should give us a better idea of what chord scale correspondences look like in the common practice style. The first four majors of the first episode of Going To Music contains the following scales, F Lydian, C Major, D Dorian, and C Major. The next major is a D Melodic Minor scale. At first glance, this passage is straightforward. The one accidental in the melody, a C sharp, is probably some sort of non-chord tone. But if we listen to the passage with chord scale unity in mind, it sounds different. I'm going to play the passage as if it were a lead sheet. I'll play the chords in root position and hold them while improvising over them using the modes described in the analysis. I hope that you could hear the modal quality of some of the scales. Now, let me play the passage with the same chords, but with the scales as Mozart wrote them. I will use rubato to emphasize the modal scale degrees.
the Lydian and melodic minor sections still sound modal to me. That's good because there's no point in using chord scale theory unless the music actually sounds the way the theory says it should. I must admit that I'm surprised that the Lydian scales actually sound like Lydian. On the page, they don't look particularly modal. I will also admit that I cheated a little. I have left out the 5, 7, and 5 chord on the last beat of the third measure. Without it, the chord progression is 4, 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, 5. This sounds like a pop tune from the 1960s. The 5 7 of 5 pulls the progression back into the classical world, but it does so only at the very last minute. The opening of the development also has some interesting chord scale features. This section begins in G minor, but does not include any E flats. This makes sense for the ascending melodic minor scales, but not for the descending ones. If I were grading this piece as a Music Theory 1 exercise, I would correct the passage by placing an E-flat in the descending scale. And my correction sounds fine, but apparently that's not the sound that Mozart wanted. The sound that Mozart got was a Dorian sound. So maybe he's thinking of this passage in G Dorian? The next measure starts with an A major scale and ends with a kind of harmonic minor scale. I say it's a kind of harmonic minor scale because it includes the pitches of a D harmonic minor scale, but it's based on A. This makes sense because it's over an A chord, really an A dominant seventh chord. So to borrow George Russell's terminology, it is D harmonic minor mode five. This is a really colorful scale. If we match chords to scales, we find that the first half of the measure is A major 7, which is a major scale, and the second half is A7 flat 9, which is a harmonic minor scale. The idea that a harmonic minor scale can be matched to certain chords is found elsewhere in the classical literature. Usually it's used over a 5-7 flat 9 as it is in the Mozart. However, there's a striking example in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony where it's used to build a tonic chord. This example, which is from the last movement of the work, uses the scale to create a tonic 13th chord. While any 13th chord is unusual in the classical literature, this one is particularly unusual because of the accidental, the C-sharp. This C-sharp creates a particularly dissonant chord. The only reason I can think of that Beethoven would have selected this pitch is because it's part of a D harmonic minor scale. In fact, the chord contains every pitch of the D harmonic minor scale. I think George Russell would have called this an example of chord scale unity. Chord scale theory can be used for composition or improvisation as well as for analysis. Let me show you how this works with an improvisation over a chord progression. The improvised melody is made up of a series of scales or arpeggios that match their associated chords. A Lydian for A major 7, C mix Lydian for C7, F Lydian for F major 7. There's a cadence in the middle of the tune based on a horizontal movement. This means that there's a series of chords that are all related by key and that push toward a goal. In this case, it's a 2-5-1 progression in E major. The improvised melody changes at this point. It includes some longer rhythmic values and it pushes toward a cadence on E major. I could make this tune more interesting by doing some chord substitutions. I could raise the fifth of the F7 in the second measure and make it augmented. 
I could change the quality of the D minor 7 in measures 4 and 5 to half diminished. I could substitute a chord a tritone away for the B7 chord at the cadence in the middle, making it an F7 chord. These kinds of substitutions make the progression more colorful and allow me to use more chromatic scales. For example, I could use a whole tone scale over the F7 sharp 5 and an octatonic scale over the D minor 7 flat 5, the half diminished chord. While this is a fairly simplistic example, it does demonstrate how the process works. This way of thinking puts a dizzying array of different scales and chords at the composer improviser's fingertips. In real life, most composers only use a small subset of these scales and chords. They pick out their favorites and they learn to exploit their characteristic sounds. 